Hello and welcome. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. We say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We sing together, Dear Lord and Father of mankind, Forgive our foolish ways.
Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song we will praise our God. A collect. O Lord, we beseech you mercifully to hear the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may both perceive and know what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to fulfil them, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Our Bible reading is from James chapter 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Kiss Me Kate is one of my favourite musicals. And to my mind, several of its song lyrics make a thought-provoking start to a sermon. Why can't you behave? Why can't you behave? After all the things you've told me and the promises that you gave, oh, why can't you behave? Second verse goes on to ask, why can't you be good and do just as you should? It's sung, of course, by a lover about her erring partner, but it could equally well apply in many other contexts. Why do people behave so badly? Many of us will on occasions think to ourselves, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why does each one of us sometimes behave so badly? That's an especially pointed question when there are difficulties in church life, the kind of quarrels and fights that James is addressing here. After all, we're redeemed people. We've got the Holy Spirit in us. God's intention is that the church should give the world a foretaste of what the kingdom is like. So how can churches sometimes be such difficult places to be? It's a good question, and one that most thinking Christians will have faced, perhaps as we've witnessed, a set to between two church members over the coffee cups, or sat in on an acrimonious church council discussion. The classic Christian answer as to what leads us astray speaks of the malign effect of three different influences, the world, the flesh, and the devil. No coincidentally that these are all referred to in James chapter 4. Starting with and majoring on ourselves, the flesh. As you may have noticed, that exact term isn't actually used, but the idea is very much here. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. The main cause of arguments in church, and for that matter all kinds of human behaviour, from wars to sexual inf infidelity to neighbour disputes, is desires from within. Most especially greed, wanting what we can't have. Either something, or more often in church life, wanting our own way. Christians don't work like that. If we want something, we're far more spiritual than that, you might say. Well, maybe. But James says, first of all, the reason you haven't got what you want is you've neglected to pray. Verse 2b. 
you do not have because you do not ask. And maybe for us sometimes, when we're convinced of certain courses the right way in the life of the church, we argue about it first rather than first really praying about it. Or maybe the problem is not lack of prayer, but rather prayer with the wrong motives. As James puts it, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Wanting our own way, wanting what we haven't got, can be shown in the wrong type of prayer as much as in our failure to pray. Either way, it's the cause of a huge proportion of human problems and conflict, both in the church and in the world. Told that 50 years ago there was a long correspondence in the Times asking, what's wrong with the world? Until it was ended by, I think I'm right in saying, G.K. Chesterton, who wrote... What's wrong with the world? I am. That's the number one answer James is giving here to what causes problems in the church. They come from desires within us, what Paul calls elsewhere the flesh. But James then mentions another classic Christian answer to the question that he's posed, why can't we be good? Pointing to the malign influence of the world. James 4 and verse 4. You adulterous people, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The world in scripture can mean one of two things. Either it can be a neutral word to describe what God has made, and though it's fallen, the world that God is longing to redeem. That's the meaning of the word in John 3.16, which speaks of how God so loved the world. But there are times when the world has a much more sinister meaning in scripture of the human race organized against God. That's typified in 2 Timothy chapter 4 when Paul laments a man called Demas abandoning the Lord's work because he loved this world. You see the difference. The world in its first sense the world that God has made and that he longs to redeem, well, a Christian must surely love the world in that sense as our Lord loves it, but not in the second sense, in which loving the world means being seduced by its ways. It might seem a bit of a subtlety, but in practice, when you cross over from loving the world in one sense to loving it in another, it can be blindingly obvious. In the film The Missionary, Michael Palin starts off as an archetypal Victorian missionary clergyman, in his case going to work in the slums to try and redeem the fallen women there. But sadly, loving the world in that right sense soon becomes loving the world in the wrong sense, and it doesn't take a sophisticated theologian to tell when he's crossed the line. It's the difference between loving the world despite its fallenness and loving the world because of its rebellion against God. And of course, it's the latter that's being talked about here by James when he speaks of friendship with the world. To him, it's as cut and dried as adultery. Commitment to the Lord means commitment to the Lord and his ways. Even just a friendship with the world in its rebellion against God counts as adultery. It's tantamount to hatred towards God, makes a person an enemy of the Lord. The way the world can sometimes lead a person astray was something evangelical Christians in a previous age were very strong on. That's why they had such uh, definite taboos against things like theatre and dancing. Now, even if we may think those taboos were perhaps rather legalistic, we mustn't lose sight of James's warning. The world can lead us astray. The context of disputes in church, for example, it's all too easy to import worldly ways of conducting arguments, caricaturing the opposing position, conducting whistling, whispering campaigns behind people's backs, writing those in leadership intemperate letters which demand a reply. These techniques may even be successful in getting our point of view across, but that doesn't make them right. When there are debates in the life of the church, as, in the, as is in the case of many denominations at the moment, regarding uh, their stance towards same-sex relationships, what well, both sides need to make sure we make our contribution appropriately and gently, not belittling others, however convinced we might be, that they are wrong and we are right. 
I'm not sure if that's the kind of thing James was seeing happening in the churches he was writing to. If it was, it explains the strength of his language. Adopting worldly ways doesn't just get a mild rebuke, he throws the kitchen sink at it. Friendship with the world in its fallenness counts as adultery. It's tantamount to hatreds towards God. So in answer to the question, why can't we behave, James has spoken of the influence of the flesh and of the world. He doesn't neglect either the third of the classic Christian answers, the devil. James 4 and verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Note that as in almost all the New Testament letters, there's not a dwelling on that side of things. The devil exists. He's part of the reason why we as Christians and everybody else goes astray. But he's also a defeated enemy. So much so that we just have to resist him and we're promised he will flee. C.S. Lewis's famous comment on the devil was that there were two equal traps Christians can fall into. One is to disbelieve his existence, but the other is to overestimate his importance. Resist the devil is part of the New Testament teaching, but only a small part of its emphasis. And I'd suggest that we should reflect that in our prayer and our worship, both privately and corporately. Acknowledging the devil, maybe sometimes praying for protection or articulating our resistance to the forces of evil, but making sure that emphasis doesn't take over. So we've got quite a comprehensive answer to why things go wrong in church life, why most human groups can sometimes descend into quiet quarrels and fights. And though understanding the causes of the problem may well take us three quarters of the way to overcoming, we can't finish by uh, without a focus on what James says about how to put them right. From verse 7 of James chapter 4. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. I'm going to highlight four aspects to what James says here very briefly. First of all, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Formal submission to God and his way of doing things. Next up, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. One way we draw near to God is when we pray. And the wonderful promise is given that when we do that, he will draw near to us. Thirdly, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep, yet your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. That speaks of real penitence for the past. Not just saying, I'm sorry, but being sorry and showing it. And maybe if this chapter has challenged us about how we've caused arguments by wanting too much of our own way in church or anywhere else, Penitence before God is appropriate. And then lastly, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. That's repeating a promise that's made in the Psalms. If we are humble in God's eyes, we'll be great. Why can't I be good? It's a good question that Cole Porter's song poses. And here in James, we have not only an accurate answer to the question, we also have a clear prescription of what we need to do to begin to put things right. Amen. As we turn to God in prayer, in the way James has been encouraging us to, we sing, hear our prayer, God above, as we come to you and seek your patient love. After which Jane Machen will lead us in our intercessions.
be our stay Give us eyes to see you answer prayer this day Hear us praise all you've done We rejoice as we receive the victory So we pray in faith Your will be done As we long to see Your kingdom come We ask with a loud voice We ask with a loud voice We ask with a loud voice Through Jesus Christ our Lord Father God, hear us as we turn to you in prayer. As we bring to you the needs of the world, may we not only see but look and perceive, not only hear but listen and respond. Your church is all around us and we are but a few of its members. In togetherness and joy, we thank you for the riches of your revelation. Help us to be united in your truth. Strengthen each of us to serve you in the roles to which we are called. And we pray for Bishop Michael and Bishop Matthew, Archdeacon Megan, Rural Dean and Vicar Andrew, those who serve here at St Andrews in recognised roles, and those who, in unseen and untold ways, contribute to the life and growth of your church. We thank you for devoted service given and ask that your Holy Spirit will guide us day by day. We pray for the Deanery Synod members as they vote for the General Synod representatives and pray that those chosen by you will be elected. We pray for the Shaping for Mission initiative as priorities are discussed and ideas shared within deaneries to enable sustainable mission and ministry, and we pray for your guidance for those leading this process. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless and guide Elizabeth our Queen, and let the majesty of our nation be that we follow in the way of your justice and peace. We pray for our government, and especially those taking up new posts in the Cabinet. We pray for the new Education Secretary and the Department for Education that decisions taken may enable all children and students to be given the best opportunities suitable for their needs. We pray for those with responsibility for the health service and for making decisions about tax and funding. We pray that you will guide them to work with honesty and integrity and for the good of all people. And we remember our Prime Minister Boris Johnson as he continues to shoulder the heavy burden of responsibility as he grieves for his mother, praying that you will strengthen and sustain him. And we pray for all who mourn the loss of a loved one at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for our neighbours here in our parish, in our town, in our country and around the world. We pray for the people of Afghanistan, those who live in fear, those who have been forced to leave their homes, for the people of Lebanon in the grip of a devastating economic crisis where fuel shortages have disrupted the work of hospitals for the security deal between the United States, Australia and Britain, that it will be a force for peace. For refugees and the homeless, those risking their lives to get to safety, those without food or water, those living in danger, who are not safe even in their own homes, 
especially children who are not receiving the care that they should. We pray for those making decisions that will affect the lives of these people, giving thanks for the aid agencies around the world and praying for their safety and well-being. May those who suffer know that they are not forgotten and that you hear their cries. May they find the strength to cope and may their needs be met. We pray for those who suffer in body, mind or spirit and those in particular that are known to us. Remembering Peter Swan, Trish Glover, Carenza Wood and Linda Stonia. Comfort them in their distress, heal them of their affliction, and by your saving grace bless them with eternal joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, although we do not understand the necessity of suffering in your creation, whether in disease or in natural disaster, transform our confusion into rededication of our will and grant us determination to win through, even when the pain or disability threatens to overwhelm us with no end in sight. When we suffer the smaller discomforts, let us use them to relate to those who suffer severely, so that with greater sensitivity and perception we may be agents of your loving concern. Through suffering, Give us grace to know more fully the glory of that resurrection life, won for us through your cross and your triumph over death. We pray for all who spread your word, especially where this puts them in danger. We pray for Jimmy and Katia Rocks in Brazil and give thanks for their growing church and their witness to the people they meet. We pray, Lord, for the people who are part of our daily lives, our families, friends, colleagues, professionals and strangers, those we know by name and those we know by sight. We thank you for the people who care for us when we need them, those who reach out in friendship, those who pray for us. We pray especially for those who don't yet know you, that you may become more than a name, that they may open their hearts to you and join us in worshipping you. We pray for the children in our parish and our local schools, that they may have the opportunity to learn about you. We pray for our children and families worker, Naomi, and give thanks for the work that she does. We pray that you will help us all to spread the good news of your love for us. With all believers, we put our trust in you and commend ourselves to your gracious keeping in the sure and certain knowledge that wherever we go, you will be with us always. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless us and watch over us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us and give us peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always.